Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is civil war intervention and how the threat of intervention can cause issues with nuclear negotiations. I want you to think through some recent conflicts that the United States has been involved in and what they all have in common. To start, here's the Syrian civil war. And before that, we have the Libyan civil war. Before that, we have the war in Afghanistan. If we go back to the 90s, we have the Kosovo War. And if we go back to the 80s, we have the US involvement in Grenada. What each of these conflicts has in common is that the United States was helping a rebel group overthrow the government of the particular country. Now let's think about how civil war intervention connects with nuclear negotiations. As always, the main idea behind nuclear negotiations is that an opponent and a potential proliferator think about how the world would work if the potential proliferator acquired nuclear weapons. Here, the distribution of the good would be balanced at the dashed line. And then in the present, the opponent can offer a deal commensurate with that, but take a little bit more for itself and give a little bit less to the potential proliferator because the potential proliferator doesn't have to pay the cost to develop those nuclear weapons. I've always illustrated the idea of nuclear negotiations with a strip of territory, but the central idea goes beyond that. You can think about this as any policy in dispute, including, for example, how much the U.S. would intervene in the domestic politics of a particular country. What the model tells us in this case is very similar to before. If the opponent wants the potential proliferator not to develop nuclear weapons, then it needs to basically treat the potential proliferator as though it already has nuclear weapons. And if we're thinking about that in terms of domestic political influence, that means the United States basically needs to take a hands-off approach with the potential proliferators. Otherwise, the potential proliferator would want to acquire a nuclear weapon for the sake of stabilizing the regime. Thus, in principle, it's not obvious why the threat of intervention would lead potential proliferators to actually acquire nuclear weapons. Instead, it would benefit both parties if the opponent simply took a step back, promised not to intervene, and then allowed the potential proliferator not to have to spend the cost to develop nuclear weapons. Both would be better off under those circumstances. Unfortunately, there's a commitment problem here. One of the assumptions in the baseline model is that the potential proliferator had a static capacity to build nuclear weapons. It would not change from year to year. As such, if the opponent were to ever stop giving concessions, then the potential proliferator could respond to that by developing nuclear weapons and punish the opponent for having gone back on the deal. Similarly, the model assumed a static preventive war capacity. That is, from year to year, the cost of fighting a preventive war from the opponent's perspective wasn't really going to change very much. Civil war concerns upend both of these assumptions. Think of it from Kim Jong-un's perspective. In any given year, North Korea doesn't really need nuclear weapons to stop the United States from intervening in civil wars. That's because, in any given year, North Korea doesn't really have civil wars going on. But there may at some point be a civil war. And at that point, we have an issue. If Kim Jong-un does not have nuclear weapons at that point, the United States has a now or never opportunity to overthrow the government. Failure to intervene on behalf of the rebel group will mean that the rebel group will get crushed, and the United States will lose its best opportunity for regime change in the country. This, of course, is exactly what happened with the United States and Libya. Put differently, we have a commitment problem. The opponent cannot credibly promise non-intervention in civil war, and the potential proliferator builds nuclear weapons to guarantee safety. The opponent would love to be able to promise not to go in should a civil war break out, because that would mean that the potential proliferator would have no reason to develop nuclear weapons. The problem is that when push comes to shove, the opponent will want to intervene. And under the standard model, the way that the potential proliferator would punish the opponent for backtracking on its agreement is to build nuclear weapons instead. 
The problem there, though, is that the Civil War is going to remove the government from existence. And as a consequence, the potential proliferator will not be around long enough to punish the opponent for backtracking on the deal. Internalizing all of that, the government simply builds nuclear weapons while it can. There's an interesting implication here, given that the focus of nuclear weapons is usually on interstate coercion. Think about a situation where a rebel group is very vulnerable, such that they would only want to initiate a conflict against the regime if they were anticipating an intervention from a third party, namely an opponent like the United States. In that case, proliferation decreases the likelihood of civil war. By acquiring nuclear weapons, the government convinces the opponent not to intervene, and internalizing that, the rebel group never chooses to initiate a preventive war in the first place. This makes it all the more difficult for nuclear negotiations to work out. The potential proliferator is not only seeing the benefit of deterring intervention, but also deterring civil war. And that's despite the fact that, within the model, we're only thinking about the potential proliferator as having use for nuclear weapons against the opponent, and not directly using the nuclear weapons against a rebel group. Zooming out, this helps make sense out of some recent trends that we've seen in nuclear proliferation. Think about what the regimes looked like in Libya, North Korea, Iraq, and Syria at the time each of those countries initiated their nuclear programs. Here we have four autocratic regimes, each of which the United States is not particularly friendly with. Moreover, within each of those countries, there's a large subsection of individuals who are not satisfied with those governments either. Thus, there is not only potential for civil war, but also for the United States to intervene in the process. That said, each of these countries has experienced a different ending for their nuclear aspirations. With Libya, the AQ Khan network was shut down, and thus Gaddafi no longer had an affordable route to developing a nuclear weapon. They reached an agreement with the United States instead. North Korea was successful, first trying a test in 2006, certainly being successful in 2009, and by today, having a nuclear weapons arsenal. The United States quashed Saddam Hussein's aspirations for developing a nuclear weapon in the 1991 Persian Gulf War, and of course removed Saddam Hussein entirely in the 2003 Iraq War. Finally, Syria has had a couple of issues. To begin, Israel initiated a preventive strike against a key facility. And second, after that occurred, Syria has been mostly distracted by a civil war and can't really finance a nuclear weapons program at the moment. Pertinent for this conversation, of course, is the fact that the United States has indeed intervened in the Syrian civil war. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.